and welcome to another episode of Making a Club Champion. I hope you're all well. I've just actually come back from caddying at the first round of Q School for the European Tour at the Players Golf Club in Bristol. Um, where actually my player did get through. He managed to get shoot a flawless three under on the last day to get through by two shots. So if you actually want to listen to that episode, it's quite fascinating about Matthew Perry. I think it's episode five. And also a small mention to Scott Gregory, who will be featuring on the show in the up and coming weeks, who also got through, who shot a, a fascinating... Fas- a fascinating, not fascinating, a fantastic four under round uh, to close out and make it by, I think, two or three places as well. Anyway, in this episode, um, we are featuring a lady called Dr. Nikki Lum. Uh, Nikki specializes in golf practice, skill development, and performance enhancement. I reckon if you could sum up Nikki's teachings in three words, it would be performance, statistics, and data. So a lot of it's focused on how you practice how you prepare for tournaments, and how you really get to know your game through numbers and data. How big are your misses? Um, Are you playing into specific strengths uh, on the golf course? Or are you playing into your weaknesses all the time? Um, Perhaps not hitting it close to the hole actually benefits from you. Perhaps you want to be hitting uh, to specific yardages where you're stronger at. So it's really getting to know uh, your numbers, um, your yardages, and how big are your misses with each given club. Uh, Nikki is an international speaker and has recently given presented her PhD research at the World Scientific Congress of Golf in Canada. She works with all abilities of golfers, including elite amateurs to touring professionals to fulfill their potential. She has a PhD in optimising practice for peak performance, as well as a master's in sports coaching, where she specialised in elite performance. A couple of things you're going to learn in this episode is how to identify where you are now with your game, how to set goals for the future, and how to create a step-by-step plan going forward to achieve those goals, how to record stats on your game, what sort of stats you should be taking, and how to record them, and again, how to Play to your strengths and steady your weaknesses and head into specific areas on the golf course which are going to um, be understood through data and you're going to build all of this performance through specific numbers about your game. So I think if you could sum it all up in a couple of words, this podcast episode is about performance statistics about your game and I'll leave it with that and I hope you enjoy this fascinating talk with Dr Nikki Lum. Nikki Lum welcome to the show. Thank you Chris good to talk to you. Um, So I was wondering if we could perhaps start with if a client comes to see you for the first time um, what does that first initial process look like um, to give some context to the listeners of perhaps some of the things you do in and around the field of golf? Okay, so if a client was coming to see me um, for help with their um, performance, we would sit down in a session and basically discuss where they are now, what their goals are for the future, and then come up with a plan of how we can work towards achieving those goals. And I wonder if you could just touch, what does that sort of plan initially look like? Okay, so the plan would involve really trying to establish a baseline for where they are now um, in terms of their game and everything they're doing. Uh, So I would would ideally put them through an assessment to find out exactly where they are or if they've got um, playing statistics, I would have a look at those and analyse them. And then from that point on, I'd be encouraging them to actually record their playing stats every time they play so that I can actually see exactly where they are. Um, you know, it, if everything that I do really needs to be measured so I know exactly where they are now and then we can work towards trying to get them where they want to go, but very much in a in a measured way so that we can actually see if they are improving or if they're not, why are they not improving and, and go from there really. So the, the, the starting point really is knowing exactly where they are in the key skill sets that I believe contribute to creating a total score. Um, if you look on, if, if, if a player comes in and they shoot 72, Um, That's their end result. But the question is, how is that 72 made up? And players, no no matter what level they're at, everyone will have their own strengths and weaknesses. And that score will be created um, by a combination of those strengths and weaknesses. And and the the starting point really is finding out exactly where they are in all of those key skill sets. 
And if if a player is coming to to work with you for the first sort of time, what what sort of stats should they uh, know um, to present you? And then perhaps you know, sort of six months down the line, how how have those sort of um, stats changed over the course of time to what they're actually looking at to record? Um, you know, when working with you. Okay, so as a starting point, to be honest, a lot of players that come to see me haven't been recording their stats. So that's our first um, our first starting point, really, is getting them from that point onwards to record stats. And we, we can, the, ideally, I would put them through an assessment. I use an, the, an F, Every Ball Counts assessment. Every Ball Counts are a company in the USA. They're based in West Palm Beach. And they've basically built a assessment, an assessment that once a player goes through it, it's over 320 shots. And at the end of that, it tells you exactly where they are in the 19 skill sets that try to contribute to a player's total score. And this assessment is actually endorsed by the PGA Tour as well. So at the end of it, we actually can see, right, this is where a player is now. And this is where they aspire to get to. If, you, if a player then looks on the um, short link data on the PGA Tour, they can actually see where they are in comparison to players who are number one in each category on the PGA Tour or number 100th. And obviously, we can then scale that back depending on where they currently are and, and when, where they aspire to get to. Obviously, if I'm working with a club golfer, we, don't, we, don't, we wouldn't go into anywhere near as much detail um, on, on every area. Um, but obviously, if I'm working with a player who aspires to get onto the PGA Tour, we need we need as much information as possible. Okay. Could, could we perhaps touch on um, some of those stats and you know are those fairways and fairways hit, greens and regulation? Okay, it's it's a bit more in depth than that. So basically, it's looking at the, the skill sets are really around um, how many putts they tend to make from three feet, how many putts they'll make from four to eight feet, from ten to fifteen feet. If they're 10 yards from the hole, what's their average proximity to the hole? If they're 10 to 20 yards away from the hole, what would be their average proximity from that distance as well? And then hitting into greens from 50 to 75 yards, 75 to 100 yards. You know, at the moment, what is their average proximity to the hole? And then if we get all that information going back, so so we, we use these skill sets kind of 50 to 75 yards, 75 to 100, 125, sorry, 100 yards to 125 yards, and so on, we go all the way back and then see how accurate they are off the tee and also see what their driving distance is. And basically from getting all of this information together, we can then create a plan of how I can help them best to um, reduce their scoring average and help them to play better golf. And what you'll find is that basically within, within all these skill sets, players will tend to use certain ones a lot more than others. So depending on how long the courses are that they tend to play and also depending on how um, how long they are off the tee, that's going to be very influential in what they're on their average shot into the green most times they play in competition. So then we can work hard at trying to get them as strong as possible in the distances that they're hitting as often as, you know, as, as, as when well, they're hitting as often as they, you know, they tend to hit more often into the greens really. Yeah, I was actually thinking the other night of it, it, does it matter of what courses we play sort of around the country, around the world, if our game is very consistent of the way we approach it? So we're always actually hitting into similar spots and making the same mistakes over and over again, um, simply by how far we hit it off the tee and, you know, playing the course to our own ability, if that makes sense. Yeah, obviously we're always always going to do our best, you know, hit the ball as far as we can off the tee and be as accurate as possible. But the distances that we're going to hit the ball into the green is going to be determinant on the length of the course. So if we always hit the ball off the tee, just for example, 260 yards, and on some courses they're a lot longer, obviously our approach shots into the green are going to be a lot longer. Whereas if we're playing on a short course and we're driving the ball 260 yards off the tee, our set our shots into the green are going to be a lot shorter. So therefore, depending on whether we're stronger from a shorter distance into the green or whether we're more accurate from a longer distance into the green, that will actually be quite a determining factor as to what score we're likely to shoot when we're playing different length courses. And people often think, oh, well, you know, the short, the nearer you are to the hole, the better. And that is the case. But there are certain players who are actually more accurate with a seven iron and six iron in their hand than they are with a nine iron or an eight iron or a wedge. 
Um, so it just depends really on you know how a play you know where a player's strengths and weaknesses are within all their skill sets. So I presume with with, with this collected data, you 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 get a sort of this, a strengths and weaknesses uh, for a golfer. Yes. Do you, do you sort of uh, amplify the strengths and and sort of um, work on the weaknesses, or do you just try and increase the weaknesses into sort of a more less damaging shots and just keep the strengths um, to where they are? Um, it depends really on which shots are the strengths and which shots are the weaknesses. Obviously, we always want to get our strengths stronger because they probably would have got us into the position where we are to start with. And we always do want to improve on our weaknesses. Um, but the, the crucial thing is really finding out when we're competing, which skill sets we're using the most and trying to get them as strong as possible. Um, just say, for example, a player is, a, you know, is very good between 100 and 125 yards into the green. Their proximity to the hole is, is, is very strong, but they're not very good from 150 to 175 yards into the green. And when they're competing, that's the distance that they tend to be challenged the most with, and that's the distance they tend to be hitting in from the most, then obviously we need to get that as strong as we possibly can because that's the skill that, that, that they need to, that's going to help them to reduce their scoring average as quickly as possible. And how would, what, what specific drills or uh, practice sessions would you implement uh, once highlighted these perhaps weakness elements in one's game? How would you sort of design a program to increase them and make them into a strength? Okay, it really depends on what the player's um, strength, strength, it, sorry, weakness is. And also, you know, is it, is it a technical issue that we need to work on? Or is it more of an accuracy issue? Um, is it a distance control issue? You know, what, what is it that, you know, which, what is it that we really need to try to break down and improve? So basically, from that perspective, I try and break practice down into three elements. One is the technical side. Um, when we, it's very much focused on swing mechanics and trying to improve those. And in some cases, I'll work with players on those. But in other cases, especially if I'm working with players more at the elite level, they'll have their swing coaches. Um, and then I try and complement the work that the swing coach does with the player. So basically, when they're in the technical model, they're very much working on their swing technique. They're trying to improve feels, trying to get into better positions. And the crucial thing in this area is that players really are focused on the process of trying to improve what it is they're trying to do. And they're not worried about the outcome of where the ball's going initially. Their focus really is very much on, you know, trying to improve that movement that they're trying to make in their swing. Um, so in that respect, when they're working on their swing technique, initially they'll use quite a lot of block practice which means hitting the same shot time and time again while they're trying to improve their feel um, in a particular area. They might be trying to get their, um, I don't know, their, 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 their left wrist a bit flatter in the backswing. So the focus needs to be heavily on, on every shot. Are they really working hard and emphasising getting that left wrist flatter? And to do that, they're going to need to do quite, quite a lot of repetition in order to try to really get that feel and, and emphasise that feel. Um, and then once they've kind of, that's how I would suggest they work in the technical side of things. And then you move on to the training element where training is very much about repetition, but it's about variation within the repetition. So we're not, we're not hitting to the same target with the same club every time. We're putting more variation into it. We're making our practice accountable. So, you know, we're scoring ourselves out of 10 or seeing how many shots it's going to take us to achieve 10 of something maybe to hit to a certain distance within a certain um, degree of accuracy and then we have the final um, part which is tournament which is one shot one opportunity which really is trying to replicate you know what we do on the golf course and what we do in competition great and uh, how would one structure that over the course of say a week or a month how long could each one of those phases take uh, sort of to get into that sort of competition training mode well, it, it depends really where they are in their season. Um, if they're in the winter, they might spend more time working on the technical side because they haven't got competitions coming up. But what I found is really that every player I've ever worked with, they're always trying to improve their swing technique. So normally within every session, it's a matter of doing an element of swing technique work 
doing an element of training and an element of tournament. So you're always really blending the three. It's just at different times within the season, you might put more emphasis on one part than the other. So right now we're kind of in the middle of the season. So there's probably with a lot of players, they're not going to be worried too much about working on their swing technique. They're going to need to manage it so they don't fall back into any old habits. And they're going to obviously keep trying to move forwards within within that area. But their focus is going to be predominantly on the training and the tournament area because at the moment they're competing. So they need to be working on you know being as accurate as they can with their shots so that they score the best they can when they go out and play. For, for the listeners who are listening to this, what would be the, the sort of best way for them to collect data on their game? Um, base depends what they want to do. There's, there's, there's a package out there called um, Shot by Shot, um, which is a great app that players can fill in. Um, they, you know, they can record their stats and put the, their information into that. And it, um, it collects things quite nicely and gives them good reports on that. Um, there are other stats packages out there. That's the one I tend to use quite a lot. Um, and then I've also got, depending on what players are working on, I run, I, I create kind of a stats package for them as well so that it goes into a little bit more detail than a shot by shot in some areas. But that, that's that's a good one to use as a starting point. Okay, I'll be sure to include that in the, the show notes. I think we, we touched on, you know, how would you define sort of a great golf practice session? Um, I was just wondering what, what would... What would a, a great practice session look like for an average golfer? Um, and then what actually would be a bad uh, practice session, um, some sort of bad habits to get into as well? Okay, I think a great practice session is when you set yourself a goal for your practice and you can walk away from the session saying, yes, I've achieved my goal. Um, you know, it, it depends what that goal is. Um, but basically, it's just really paying full attention to every shot you hit and trying to get the most out of that shot. I always use the analogy of you see people at the gym and you see the guys who are really serious. So every time they they lift a weight or they do any form of, I don't know, say bicep curl, you can really see them. They're really specific on their form. They're really specific in trying to make sure that they're really getting that that curl and they're really paying attention to, to every single move they're making. And then you can see other people in the gym that might have a dumbbell in their hand, but they're not... Uh, they're not too worried about their form. They're going through the motions and that as they're trying to actually do that bicep curl, their body's swinging around as well. And they're not really getting the most out of that, out of the movement. And I think that practice is exactly the same. You know, two people can go through the same practice session. One can give it their absolute full commitment and get an awful lot out of it. And another can go through the motions. They cannot really think about what they're doing on every shot they're not paying their full attention on every shot and therefore they're not really getting maximum benefit out of it. So any a practice session is a good session when they've you know, set themselves a goal and they've gone out and achieved that goal. And sometimes the goal might be to achieve a personal best within practice and every now and then that will happen, but that's not going to happen all the time. So during a practice session, to have a good session, it's really about being accountable, um, setting yourself some challenges and trying to achieve that but really walking away after and saying during that practice session, you know, I really did the best that I could. I gave every shot my full attention, you know, and and, and I, I really feel that I've benefited from that session. I, I, I don't know how often you've been to the driving range, but you see people just hitting ball after ball, fire, fire, fire. And when they've come away from it, yeah, okay, they've hit 50 or 100 balls. They've done a lot of quality practice. Sorry, they've done a lot of quantity practice, but I'm not really sure that the quality was actually there. And regarding you know breaking down that sort of strengths and weaknesses in someone's game, how what's the percentage on on each? Say if they were at the range, should they be working on their strengths, and what percentage should they be working on their weaknesses? Um, that's a difficult question because it really depends on, as kind of said before, how often they're using their strengths in competition and how often they need to use their weak, you know, how often they're using their weaknesses. Um, if they don't tend to use their weaknesses very often, then I would say they need to be working you know, as much as they can on their strengths. But if it's the case that they're very weak in an area that they tend to use a lot when they're playing, then obviously they need to spend a lot of practice time trying to work on that to try to improve that. Really, I mean, practice needs to be about trying to play better golf on the golf course. It needs to be very much orientated towards trying to reduce a player's stroke average. So it's just about identifying 
which shots are going to help them to reduce their stroke average as quickly as possible. As the um, I know there's, I think I heard like Gary Wollstenholme used to only practice for like an hour at a time. Um, yeah. Is there a specific, you know, amount of time one should spend practicing? Um, and should it be sort of daily, weekly? How could one perhaps best structure a week's worth of practice or a, a month's worth of practice? I think it depends on really what standard they what standard they are and how much time they have. But I'm definitely um, a fan of saying little and often, as opposed to doing one mega practice session and then not practicing for a number of days. If you could find, you know, if someone's a, a club golfer and they're working full time, if they could find a way of spending, if they had an, if they've got two hours a week to spend practicing, I'd much rather them see them actually doing four thirty minute practice sessions than one two hour practice session. Mm. And and they would they would fine tune that that say given thirty minutes with the sort of data they would have collected using one of these tools or softwares. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, probably if they were going to have if they were going to hit for thirty minutes, um, if they were just going to work on their long game within that time period, I'd probably suggest them using, hitting the first fifteen twenty balls and working in the technical stage, so they can really work on trying to improve their swing technique and focusing on the process of doing that and not worrying about the outcome at all. And then for the remaining balls of the session, dividing them up and maybe using the final 10 shots to um, go through the tournament process, uh, one shot, one opportunity to pick out different targets on the driving range and use different clubs, um, you know, to, to constantly change the clubs so that they basically replicate what they're doing on the golf course and actually scoring those shots as well as to how accurate they are in their shot making. And then the remainder of those shots I'd be using in the training element where they're kind of using repetition, um, but variation within that to actually see how many shots they can hit within 10 feet of a target or 20 feet of a target, depending on what, they, what their standard is. As well, what, what, as, you know, once you take this, uh, this approach to the golf course and in a competition mode, I mean, we had Dave Allred on the show and he said, um, Confidence is based on fact, i.e. you've done it before. And yes. he said if you've if there's like a back right pin and you've got 120 yards, but in practice session you know you've you can hit a pitching wedge to an average of six feet, therefore then in a competition you you can say I would aim just about six feet left and, and keep it below the hole and therefore I've done this in practice, therefore I can do it again in a competition state of sort of um, performance-like mode. What what sort of mindset does one carry when playing in a competition using these sort of techniques? Well, basically, you, you, you take that mindset, first of all, into practice and kind of well, everything I've been saying that you would do in the training and in the tournament phase is exactly as, if, as you've just described. It's very much about knowing what your average distance is from the hole and trying to create pressure within your practices so that you say, for example, I don't know, your proximity to the hole was 10 feet. It's actually saying, right, well, I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit 10 shots within 10 feet. How many shots is it going to take me to get 10 balls within 10 feet of that target? And straight away, that's creating some pressure within practice. And this would be within the training element because you're now accountable because you can't finish this practice until you've achieved 10 shots until you've got 10 balls that have actually landed within 10 feet of your target. So by creating pressure in practice, that's preparing you for the situ that's preparing you for the situation when you're competing, because when it, obviously when you're competing, every ball counts. So we need to take that mindset and that behavior into practice as well. And therefore when we're competing, it's, you know, it's not something completely different. It's not, oh goodness, I've suddenly got a scorecard in my hand. It's well, this is just what I do all the time because I'm just used to being accountable for all of my actions. Mm. But the, you obviously you, you couldn't do this without knowing all of that data in the first place. So I, I presume that's that's certainly one big takeaway that the golfers listening can uh, start to implement straight away. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of a lot of golfers purely record their their do they have they hit the fairway and have they hit a green and how many putts they've made. Uh, or how many perhaps they've taken during their round. And those stats aren't really very helpful. Um, what players really need to know is from certain distances, 
How accurate are they in hitting into the green? What's their average proximity to the hole with each club, with each from from distances? And that will really help them to be able to plan the way they play because they can manage that. They can manage the way they play a lot better because they know from different yardages and with different clubs what their average proximity to the hole is. So therefore, they know how near how near to the flag they can aim or whether they need to aim away from the flag and really go for the centre of the green. So it's about managing your practice better, but also managing the way you play better so that you actually have a far better idea as to you know, where you need to be aiming on the green. A lot of people just tend to go on the course and aim at the target all the time. And often if you've got a pin that's cut very tightly on the right side and you've got water on the right and a bunker in front of it, not in a lot of golfers' cases, it's normally best if they aim you know, well to the left of, that, of the flag. And that really the question is how far to the left and the stats will give them that information. Let's say if a golfer was just collecting this like in a this data in a journal like format, how would they best record it? Would they just see if they're playing in, in a tournament or round of golf? Would they just say hole one, 154 yards, seven iron, 15 yards left and 10 yards short of pin? Yeah, I mean, that that's one way of doing it. So what I would say is a starting point is they obviously hit it off the tee. They record whether they've hit the fairway, missed it left, missed it right, but no, no, you know, record which one they've missed it. And then how far have they got to the hot, how far have they got to the pin? Okay. They've got 156 yards to the pin. Um, what's the wind doing? How much, how far is that hole playing? So if it's 156 and there's no wind and they want to go at 156, they then hit the ball to the green and then they get to the green and they then pace off and they, they, it's, it's, it's 20 foot from the hole. Then they record 20 feet. Um, and that's the length of their first putt. And they therefore know from 156 yards, they've just hit the ball to within 20 feet. And then they hit the putt to from 20 feet and they miss the hole, but it's by one foot and their second putt is one foot. And they record that as well. So they put 20, maybe slash one. So they know the length of their putts. So if they go, if they follow that process all the way around the golf course, at the end of it, they know how many fairways they've hit. They know, um, they know exactly how far they've hit each shot um, into the green and they know their proximity to the hole on every on every shot as well and they can either kind of the easiest way to do that is to put it into yardage bands to start with normally at 25 yard increments so maybe 50 to 75 yards 75 to 100 100 to 125 and so on and they can start working out an average as to when they're in from that from when they're hitting from those yardage bands actually how how near to the hole do they get so if they want to do it themselves they can do but um, you know, shot by shot, kind of does it for them, and the the basic app's not that expensive, and it probably at the starting point will make their life an awful lot easier if they use that. Okay, fantastic. Um, I is there perhaps anything which or unusual habits or sort of practice sessions when you do with your golfer that perhaps you want to touch base on or bring up on the show? Um. I don't think there's anything unusual that I'm aware of that I do with players. It's just very much about trying to design their practices so that we make their time as efficient and effective as possible um, so that we help, so I can help them to get the most out of their practice sessions and basically make them accountable so that we, you know, everything, you know, basically we just try and measure everything so that we can see over time if they really are, if they really are improving and if they are great. And if they're not, we just need to look at why, um, because really all form of practice needs to be very much designed about helping players to try and reduce their scoring average. They're, they're practicing because they want to get better. So therefore we need to try to you know, make sure they do and design their practicing practice around that. Great. Is What happens if someone is very um, right brained in the sense that they are all sort of creative and feel rather than sort of analytical and, and numerical Um how would do you design the same program to sort of both style of, of players? Um, fundamentally, we still need to know the same information because we need to know how accurate they tend to be, you know, how accurate they are from, from the skill sets. And we need to, and I need to help them to become more accurate from, um, from within those distances. But the approach that I would take would probably vary a little bit depending on what their personality is and depending on, on how they tend to play. Mm. I was just thinking of like uh, like um, 
a Francesco Molinari esque character to someone like a John Daly type character. They're very, very, very uh, different uh, in, in in the styles that they would play. One is, I would imagine, Francesco be very sort of numerical and very analytical and very specific. And then imagine some some players are the complete opposite of that, and they they just play golf to play golf, and it's more about the feel. Uh, like Bubba Watson, for example. Sure, yeah. Um, um, but they're, they're still going to know how far they've got to hit the ball to the target. They're going to they might be much more creative in the way they see the ball flying and in their shot making. But they're just, before they actually hit the shot, they're still going to um, want to know exactly how far it is. And they're still going to be very specific on their intention as to what they want the ball to do as well. Because, you know, that you, I, I believe you've got to tell the brain what you want it to do. So therefore, they are going to picture the shot and imagine what they want it to do. They might just see it in a completely different way to somebody else, but they still have to execute that shot and see what they want the ball to do. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I know I we, we sort of set an action challenge for you know the um, the listeners, and I was wondering perhaps something which you believe in, or perhaps working with your clients it doesn't have to be uh, to do with golf. Uh, it could be something to do with outside of golf, but. Um, Feel free to fire away with your action challenge. Okay, well, I'd, I'd, I'd go with two. I'd go for one for golf, and that's it. if you're going to practice, actually have a goal and actually go to practice with a purpose, with the purpose of actually trying to achieve that goal. So you're actually, you know, so there's an actual purpose within what you're trying to do. Um, and then the other thing I would say kind of out of golf is just really make an effort to try and move every day. I think nowadays people just, the, the lifestyle seems to be um, so much so sedentary, and we don't tend to move around a lot. So I just I always encourage people um, who are you know who are very busy but who sit down a lot just every day to try and go for a walk or try and do a, a movement complex every you know every day just to kind of try and keep the body moving and try to you know try to help our movement to be as good as possible. Fantastic. And when picking a goal. Um... Is is there is a best way to go about that, or how, how can one best define a, a goal? Uh, it, it really depends on what they're what they're trying to work on, but just so that they can actually walk away having felt that they've accomplished something from their practice session. So you know, it might be right. Well, I'm today. I'm going to try and hit. I'm going to try and get ten balls within a certain distance. And how many shots is that going to take me? So when they walk away from that practice session, they can say, right, well, today I've actually hit. 10 you know I've hit 10 shots within that um within that yardage band and it's taken me 14 and they try and do it again another time and it might, might take them 12 so they can actually then see that they've made an improvement but just something so that they can actually take it away and said yes I've achieved this for today wonderful that's a great answer thank you so much um is, it, is there any sort of uh, books or recommended resources which perhaps people could read up on um um yeah I, i'm dave already mentioned before his book the pressure principle is excellent um i think that um lynn marriott and pierre nielsen um their vision 54 books are very good as well what's that one called sorry um it uh lynn uh pierre nielsen and lynn marriott vision 54 vision 54 um, okay yeah got some very they've got some very good books one being be a player okay that's a very good one i've definitely heard of that one um is there um, for, for, for the listeners to reach out to you or find a little bit more information about you online, is there any websites, URLs or social media? Yeah, um, I've got a website, which is nickylum.com. That's N-I-C-K-Y-L-U-M-B.com. Um, and I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Nikki Lum as well. Fantastic. Nikki Lum, thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to uh, come on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, lots of things, I think, which the listeners can... Uh, work on straight away and I think recording data about their game would be one and especially the specific uh, strategy you mentioned of uh, the proximity as a whole it's a fantastic couple of ideas yeah I mean I think that's the key to the starting point really the more players have become aware of what you know what, what they're doing and, and how accurate they are the, uh, the, the, the better they're going to play on the golf course and the better they can manage their practice and the better they can actually manage the way they play on the course Thank you so much, Nikki. Really a pleasure. You're welcome, Chris. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoyed that new episode of makingaclubchampion.com. If you'd like even more from the episode, perhaps some actionable lessons 
or listen to another episode featuring another guest, head over to makingaclubchampion.com where you'll find all of the links from this episode, all of the show notes, the actionable tools, strategies to make your game even more effective. As ever, thank you again for listening to another episode of Making a Club Champion and hope to catch you on the next one.